Okay. Last time when I was talking about the history of, of uh, genetics, I talked about Watson and Crick. This is actually, I went and got an image of the uh, X-ray scatter plot that that woman Rosalind Franklin was generating. This is a scatter plot much like the ones that she was generating. And it was from this pattern, this scatter pattern of X-rays going through a crystal of DNA that Watson and Crick determined that this is what the structure of DNA must be, a double helix. Um, so I, I kind of made fun of Watson and Crick because I said, oh, they didn't do any experiments and they just stole other people's data. Uh, they were still very bright and insightful organic chemists to figure out, to, to extrapolate back from this diffraction pattern what the chemical bonds must be between all these molecules. Uh, organic chemists before had already determined, well, it's made up of nitrogenous bases and riboses and phosphates. And the real um, breakthrough that they had was saying, this is a, a strand of deoxyribose, uh, nucleic acid, like long strands of uh, polymers of nucleotides, but how are they actually oriented together? That was their insight, okay? So we already knew chemically what they were made of, we just didn't know what it looked like structurally. So they're the ones that proposed this model of two strands going opposite each other and twisting around each other. That's that twisting pattern that gives you this um, radial symmetry here. Right. Uh, we won't go into that because I don't know much about it, but it's cool that they came up with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the double helix is two of these polymers now bonding together. So it's, there was theories going around of like maybe some people thought, well, maybe it's two uh, strands together and some of them had them going the same way, some of them had them going the opposite way. A guy named Linus Pauling thought it was a, a triplets, thought there was three strands in there. So Watson and Crick determined that it's actually two strands of DNA put together. So let's look through the double helix here. Uh, okay, so for orientation's sake, this is why you have to know how to number the carbons. So we'll start on this side. Uh, find the base. This is an A, an adis, uh, adenine. It's bonded to the first carbon in the ring. And if we trace around, you go away from the oxygen. So that's carbon one, two, three carbon is there. Fourth carbon is in the ring, and this is the fifth carbon. So this is what we call the five prime end. The, where, where's the free five carbon? That's the five prime end. So DNA is gonna be symmetrical because we're always gonna be putting a new one on the third carbon. So there's always gonna be at one end a, a fifth carbon hanging out, not bonded to anything, okay? So here's that fifth carbon and its phosphate group. And then on this side, I'm polymerizing it together. Here's the third carbon and the phosphodiester bond to the fifth carbon. Five prime to three prime is the, the next. So five to three, five to three. You're always adding a new nucleotide on the third carbon. Okay. So at this end, I've got a free exposed three prime carbon. Now the double helix is these in an anti-parallel orientation, okay? So on one strand, the five prime end goes to the three prime end. The second strand or the complementary strand that's going to stick to this in DNA has the reverse orientation, okay? So the five prime end is down here. The five prime carbon here, or the five prime nucleotide here is bonding to the three prime nucleotide here. That's how they're sticking together, in a reverse orientation, okay? So then you could trace five prime carbon through the three carbon, five to three, five to three, five to three. And whenever you polymerize, well, in most cases, when you polymerize DNA or RNA, you're always adding a nucleotide to the third carbon. So they're anti-parallel, that means they're in a reverse orientation. And the nucleotides they stick to are what we call complementary nucleotides. And this is done by hydrogen bonding between the two of them. So on this side, the three prime carbon here uh, has got a G nucleotide on it. That G is always going to specifically hydrogen bond to a C. And they're set up in such a way that when they're reverse oriented, they make really nice three hydrogen bonds and stick together, okay? This is the other cool thing about DNA is that the bases are actually kind of lock and key with each other. They really like to stick to each other, so they will do so very specifically. 
G's and C's always make three bonds. And then A's and T's only make two hydrogen bonds, which will tell you something about their strength, if you think about it. G's and C's, three bonds. A's and T's, two. Two bonds, right. And the sequences, if, I, if you see a written sequence of DNA, it's always assumed that it's telling you what one strand is from five prime to three prime, left to right. So as you're reading it, if I gave you this sequence, G-A-T-T-A-C-A. -A -A. Yeah, it's named after a movie there. Um, this, the G is the five prime end, and the A is the three prime end, okay? So you'll see it written like that. It won't often be explicitly shown. So, if it, so it's assumed that if I wrote it this way, you assume that that's the five prime end and that's the three prime end, unless I designate differently, right? And DNA is almost always going to just be read with one strand, because once you know one strand, you automatically know the other strand, because the bases are complementary, right? So, G-A-T-T-A-C-A, -A. the other strand is going to be the reverse complement, so it's going to be T-G-T-A-A-T-C, right? So now it's from right to left and the reverse complement of it, right? So once you know one strand, you always know the other. There's exceptions, but in general, the bases are pretty specific for each other. Yeah? Yeah, the base is always on the first carbon. Yeah. Yeah. So find the, where the base is attaching the first carbon and count away from the oxygen in the ring. And you won't go wrong. All right. So you can put these nucleotides together in any way you want. Like I said before, this is a language. And you could actually use that as a language. You could write a message to your friend if you wanted to in DNA language, right? <laughs> All you would have to do is come up with some kind of code system that said, what do the nucleotides in the sequence, what letter in the, in the alphabet do they stand for, right? So I could say, you know, AAA, -A -A, that stands for the letter A, right? AAT -A would stand for the letter B. AAG would stand for the letter C, and so on. You could actually translate the language into English, well, into, into uh, alpha, alpha numeric language, and then you could write it in German if you wanted to. You could write it in English, right? It's, it's a language of its own. You could translate it into any other language using a different format, right? You could theoretically, I guess, translate it into hieroglyphics, too. Um, <laughs> but you would have to use more or Chinese, right? Chinese is a, numer or is a symbolic language, right? And they've got thousands of characters. But DNA actually has the capacity to code things in Chinese, right? Um, English and, and the Western languages are nice because we're using um, letters. And there's only how many letters? 26, right? So I only have to have 26 arrangements of DNA to code for them, right? But you could theoretically code Chinese in DNA language, right? You would have to just have very many nucleotides to designate for each character, each pictogram that the Chinese language uses. So this is pretty awesome that, that there's a language inside each one of your cells. Um, the guy, a guy named Stephen Meyer, I guess like two years ago, wrote a book called Signature in the Cell. And he argues that the information content in DNA is evidence for a designer. Because languages don't just appear people agree on what the language is supposed to code for, right? If I'm going to code German with DNA language, two people have to agree that this is the code we're going to use to translate it into the other language. Languages don't just appear. They are used by people. They are used by intelligences. So Meyer's argument is if you find evidence of a language, then there was somebody who coded that language. Uh, natural processes don't explain it. Natural processes can only explain things that happen repetitively based on chemical laws or physical laws, right? So if T's always had to come after A's, 
and G's always had to come after T's, then you would always just get ATG, ATG, ATG. That's chemical laws. That's natural laws, right? The fact that the code is generic means you can have a language, and that language doesn't come about by natural law. It comes about by intelligent people coding for it, right? Uh, we'll go into intelligent design later, but I'm giving you a primer for it. The actual structure of DNA itself is unique because it can hold language. Proteins are like this too. You can arrange amino acids together, and that's basically what's going on in the cell. You've got amino acid language and you've got nucleic acid language, and the cell knows how to translate between the two, just like you and I could translate between nucleic acid language and German or English or whatever. So there are actually two languages going on in the cell. We'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, we'll talk about hydrogen bonding and RNA, and then we're probably going to have to leave genomes till next time. That's okay. All right, so hydrogen bonding. All right, this is just um, partially positive hydrogens interacting with partially negative oxygens or nitrogens. So if you remember way back to gen chem or organic chem, Nitrogens and oxygens are electron hogs, right? They hold electrons hard, uh, closer to them, so they usually have partial negative charges. And poor hydrogen can't keep a hold of his electrons, so he's usually kind of electron deficient, and so he's going to have positive charges. It's those partial positive and negative charges that form this hydrogen bond, okay? So here's a partially positive hydrogen, and the dotted line is my hydrogen bond interacting with a partially negative oxygen. So. A's and T's stick together through two hydrogen bonds. C's and G's hold together by three. Uh, which tells you something of their strength. If I had a DNA, so ignore what I just did. Uh, if I have uh, a long strand of G's and, T, G's and C's, that DNA molecule is going to stick together very tightly. If I've got a long polymer of A's and T's, that's not going to stick as tightly together as the G's and C's. It will actually take different uh, temperatures to separate the two, right? I'd have to have a higher temperature in order to break the hydrogen bonds between G and C polymers. Less energy, less heat, uh, less pressure, whatever unit of energy we're using to separate uh, A's and T's from each other. And actually, this is an interesting point. Uh, different organisms actually manipulate their genome, manipulate all their DNA in their cells to adapt to the temperature that they live in. There's two, so uh, the little purple sea urchin, the little spiny purple sea urchins, uh, those are found all the way up in, well, it's, they're found in like Baja, uh, you know, right, right near the equator in really hot environments. And they're also found living underneath the ice shelf in Antarctica. Okay, that same species of urchin is existing in those two different locations. Um, what do you think its genome content is in the species, in the varieties, in the, in the animals that are actually living under the ice shelf? Are they gonna want their genome to stick together tightly or loosely? Loosely, because there's not a lot of energy around, right? It's really cold, things are kind of stiff and sticking together. So urchins that you get from underneath the ice shelf have a higher AT content in their genome than an urchin that you would find in Baja, in a, in a hot um, tropical environment. Those would have more GCs together because they're living in a hot environment and they need their DNA to stick together. So those are urchins because they're, they're base, you know, their body temperature is based on whatever their environment is. Now if you go down to Antarctica, you know, people living in Antarctica versus people here, our body temperature is all the same, so the GC content doesn't really change. But you can actually, I had a friend who was actually doing this in grad school. He was collecting urchins from different locations and sequencing them, and he could actually kind of pinpoint to a region, latitudinal region, based on its GC content, where that organism was probably living. So genetics, even if you're an ecologist, uh, is, is an important thing. Yeah? I just wanted to know what that had to do with things like regulating body temperature, or no, no, regulating body temperature, but what is it? What is it? Well, I'm just saying an urchin can't regulate its body temperature, right? So an urchin that's living under the ice shelf is just going to be that cold, and a, an urchin living in a tropical environment is going to be that hot. Uh, we regulate ours. So. I, I, I asked the question wrong. Guys. Okay. I wanted to know uh, why it's significant that the GC content would be less in the colder area. Like, what does it have to do with that? 
it, it means, so in a cold environment, things stick together much tightly, like there's less atomic movement, right? So if it's sticking together very tightly, you're going to have to use more energy to separate your two DNA strands. So when it comes time for copying your DNA, you're going to have to separate and break all those bonds. So if you're living in a very cold environment, you, you put A's and T's together, so you don't have to use as much energy to get them apart. Yeah. OK. This is DNA. DNA is always going to be found in a double helix, hydrogen bonding between the base pairs and the complementary strands. And then Watson and Crick's other insight was that it was a twisted helix. OK, so not only were there two parallel strands, but those two parallel strands are twisting on each other right, into a double helix. And I'll get to your question in just a minute, Mark. Uh, so as they twist, it's not a completely symmetrical twist. So if you think about one strand, let's think about this strand right here. That strand has two neighbors, this strand up here and this strand down here. If it was a perfectly symmetrical twisted helix, the distance between the two would be exactly the same. Right? If you think about a spiral staircase that goes up to a loft or something like that, uh, those usually are a fairly symmetrical helix. And so if you measure the distance between the bars going up and the next bar going down, it would be almost identical. That's not true with DNA. As it's twisted, it favors one twist. Right? It's, an anti, it's not a symmetrical twist. So, the space between this strand and the upper one is a minor groove. That means they're kind of slightly closer together. And the distance between that strand and its next bottom one is a little bit further apart. That's the major groove. So DNA is always found in association with proteins. And proteins are always interacting with DNA and reading it and replicating it and turning it into RNA. Most of the time, our proteins are going to be uh, grabbing onto DNA and interacting with it in this major groove. So it's actually a, a, a clever way to allow proteins to have access to certain parts of the DNA. Yeah. I didn't have a question. Oh. I Excellent. Comments. On the time? Yeah. We're on. Oh, we're over time, aren't we? Yeah. Oh, we're three minutes over. OK. So we'll leave with this. DNA is always double-stranded. We'll talk about RNA next time, and RNA is not usually double-stranded, and that makes some interesting stuff happen. So, Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.